Now, the Wolfenden Report made a very clear distinction, I think. For instance, homosexuality between consenting adults isn't a crime. It doesn't mean to say that the church or the Wolfenden Committee don't think that it's a sin. This event is billed as the climax of Gay Pride Week, but in effect, it's the climax of ten years in which homosexuals have acquired a new pride and a new name. Two women in Northern Ireland have made legal history, becoming the first UK couple to take part in a civil partnership ceremony. Uh, we just want to say that this is a very privileged position we're in this morning, and for us this is about making a choice to uh, have our rights, our civil rights, acknowledged and respected and protected as any human being. Not too long ago, there would have been a different situations where if you came out, you're in danger, your door's getting knocked out, your window's getting smashed through, you're getting ridiculed, you're losing your job and stuff. Mm. We're still quite young as far as experiencing the world, but I'd like to think that we wouldn't have that now yeah. nowhere near as badly. I love the film uh, Another Country in which Rupert Everett plays the uh, spy Guy Burgess and he says, I knew I was gay when I was 10 and I did. I just remember the day, I must have been entering puberty, when one of my classmates walked through the door and sort of the room turned upside down. I knew I saw him in a different way. So I, of course all through my teenage years I, I was terribly guilt ridden about my sexuality. I just thought that I'd be, be doomed to hell. Back then, in, in the kind of late 80s and early 90s, um, being gay was not something that was sort of socially acceptable. It was, it, you know, you, it was viewed very much as an abnormality. Um, sort of when I was 14, the, the, the feelings were very strong. And so I was often called sort of queer and puff. But I remember a school teacher saying, oh, it's quite normal for people when they're going through puberty to fancy people of the same sex. But most people grow out of it as they get older. So I just assumed that that would happen. And when I reached the age of 18, I realised that it was unlikely I was going to grow out of it. I came out at the, the end of year nine, beginning of year ten. Um, and I had a great, I had a great experience personally. I, I, I was very nervous. I came out as bisexual, um, and I was very nervous. I remember I did it on MySpace, and I, I it was four o'clock in the morning. I'm there hovering over the keyboard. What should I say? Should I, should I say it? Um, and then I just remember going into school, and it, it was just a really positive reaction from you know from everyone, even the you know the rude boys that come up. Oh, enough respect to you for doing that. I think it, it's down to the school I went to because it was such a diverse school, because, you know, homophobia was stamped out. I, I actually thought years ago, this would be very, very difficult. I thought I'd have problems with the family, um, it would be hard to get a job, difficult to go shopping, it, it, everything would be very, very difficult. And when it came to it, it was the easiest thing I'd ever done, because there was nothing to do. Uh, I just, um, I just, reverted to being myself. Um, I didn't really have to come out because growing up, my parents always said to me whether I decided to have a girlfriend or boyfriend, they didn't care at all. And they were also like, if you're heterosexual, you don't come out. So you don't need to come out. Don't feel you need to be scared to say something. Just one day if you're like, oh yeah, I met someone. Do I want you to meet them? If it's a girl or a boy that walks through the door, I really don't mind. And my friends as well, not bothered at all either. They were like, well, just as long as you're happy, then they're happy for me. My gran that's 92 knows I'm gay. And um, she, she was told by my auntie, um, you know, she, she sort of said, oh, by Matthew's gay. And she said, well, what do you mean gay? And apparently she said, I knew it when he was a baby and Jill dressed him in those clothes. That's because it's my dad's mum. And I think my dad's finds it a little bit uncomfortable at times, um, as well as being a PE teacher, he was a footballer and he was manager of a formal club, so he comes from an, an environment where being gay is something quite negative, or particularly to be a, being a gay man. Um, but he, he's very sort of accepting about me. There are certain things that I don't talk to him about, um, it, 
which is, I suppose, normal. I mean, you don't really talk about your sex life with your parents in detail. I certainly don't want to know about theirs. But, um, but no, I mean, I mean, certainly when I've introduced partners to my parents, it's, it's never been a problem. They've sort of been made to feel welcome, which, which is nice. At the age of 33, I was about to get married. And um, we'd sent out the wedding invitations and the replies were coming back in. And I was teaching at the time and I spent the whole of the February half term looking blankly at the wall of my living room thinking, I can't do this, I can't do this. And sort of halfway through the week I rang my fiance and, and uh, obviously she was devastated. That was the beginning of probably a 15 year journey to fully accepting my sexuality. It start off with I, I sort of came out as gay but celibate and then as a result of a very long convoluted journey trying to keep my faith on board as well, which I've succeeded in doing, um, I then came out again as gay and not celibate. Well, I got married in August 67. We were very compatible, Eastern European Jewish background. We started to have kids sent to local school and we, it's the only thing we really argued about was me dressing. She just could not take this at all. I, I was sort of trapped in a, in, a, in a cell, you might say. And by 1997, she began to get very absent-minded. January 2002, she suddenly stopped eating and was taken to hospital. So when she went in, I came out. I met a consultant psychiatrist in Earl's Court um, and he got me on the hormones immediately and it was brilliant. I was working, so for about a year and a bit I worked as a woman in the office. No problem at all. I was a QS, quantity surveyor, with builders, which is a very macho environment. Um, when everyone comes out first of all, they always feel that they're the only person in the world and then, of course you're not. Some schools don't put um, LGBTQ um, rights into their curriculum, which from the school that I was from really shocked me. You can change the laws and you can change you know, what, what, what you write down on a piece of paper and how I would then go into the logistics of reporting you, but it would be nicer that if, it, if, you, if, if you didn't need to, if, if the person rather than didn't, wasn't homophobic because they were scared they were going to lose their job, they just didn't feel the need to be homophobic. I think more, more kind of the spreading of this enlightened point of view from the centre of, of big cities where it's quite easy to feel like the world is this bohemian, beautiful place where, you know, Indian gays can dance with Jewish lesbians and all this stuff. But um, I'd like to see that spread, you know, out into all the areas of the country and of the world. I was on a train and it was quite late at night. I got the sort of last train home from South End and actually went to the toilet. Um, and he, the, the, this guy forced the door open. It was one of those sliding doors. And they said, right, empty your pockets. And I was like, what, what's going on? And then they started be, hit, hit, hitting me. And, um, and then I, I kind of, I was quite shocked and I, I kind of, became a bit hysterical and they eventually got off the train. So I went to the police station and reported it and they actually found the fingerprints um, and he, the, this guy was arrested um, and he was charged for, for robbery and homophobic abuse and he pleaded guilty. Um, but if I hadn't have been persistent and reported that, um, if they would have got away with it. Now I do um, outreach with Redbridge Police um, in the cruising grounds locally because I think there's a lot of vulnerable young gay and bisexual men um, who are attacked but are frightened to report it. And someone I know actually um, was attacked about three years ago and he didn't report it and then three weeks ago the same people really attacked someone really badly and then he felt really guilty for not having reported it because he could have stopped it. 
that we should not rest until every single LGBT individual in our society can live without fear of discrimination. Yes, we can say we've come a long way. When you compare to other countries where people can be executed because of their sexuality, okay, in some ways we've got it very easy, but we've still got a long way to go in order to, to completely break out the discrimination completely. Because I studied health and social care, so there were a lot of like topics we'd have to talk about because of there were teachers that in the health and social care profession, you can't discriminate. So as much as the other girls in the class would accept that whatever job they chose, they would not discriminate um, on, uh, against someone because of their sexuality or their race or anything like that, they would always go on about how it's so wrong, it's disgusting. And I didn't want to say anything because, of, uh, because I was the only one that it would have just made things worse for me. I wasn't really going to be able to make a stand by myself. But then I just knew that after two years it'll be over. I already have friends outside of college that and obviously youth groups that I can go to where there are other gay, lesbian, bisexual people that I can hang out with and be as open as I'd like to. Quite a few people will have heard of what are called ex-gay organisations. They were very common in America, they still are, but there were a few of them here. And because I didn't at that time, at the age of 33, think that um, it would be appropriate for me to express my sexuality, uh, but at the same time, I needed to relate to other gay Christians. Um, I, I got involved in this organisation socially and then ended up working for it. And it fitted where I was at at that time. And although a lot of people think, well, how could you have worked for something that they would see as anti-gay? We never claimed that you could um, change your sexuality. It was, it was sort of about helping people to, to be celibate uh, as gay people. I've known people who have been rejected by the gay community because of their faith and by the Christian community because of their sexuality. And that's really sad. I think they need to have space to work through their issues and, and to just be able to embrace both those parts of themselves and integrate them happily. I have a number of Muslim friends who really struggle with this. All of them sooner or later seem to succumb to the thing of having to have an arranged marriage. So I think all faith communities are struggling with it, but I think it's really important for um, people of faith who are gay or, or LGBT to experience acceptance with the, within the gay community because they can get ostracised by both. At the end of 2004, beginning of 2005, I'd had surgery and I, I thought I'd do a picture of the mantelpiece. The picture, then I went, then I went, and then I thought I, I knew I'd done about 20. Men dressing as women, as women are a very taboo subject. If you ever see it on television, it's always laughed at, it's always sneered. I would like to see, I think what I'd really like to see is, um, the trans community coming out as being much more normal, being doctors, accountants, solicitors, bakers, just lead ordinary lives, something like that. See, Pride, I know that Pride was born of Stonewall and the Stonewall riots and I know at one point it was a lot more political and actually if I was a Turkish, you know, Muslim who couldn't possibly dream of speaking about this, couldn't come and do an interview like this, who couldn't, you know, whose own family would ridicule him, if there's one week, one weekend of the year where you could sneak away and go to Pride and, and, and feel surrounded by love and by acceptance, how can that be a bad thing? The Pride in London, I'm, I quite like that. I re, I, I, every year I, 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 we walk in it, I've got a banner for it. Um, and um, that's great because you walk down uh, Oxford Street and into Regent Street, I like, and I wave the banner, and I shake hands with people, and say, hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> it's brilliant, that's brilliant. Years ago, I used to watch it, the, Pride, the London Pride. In the 70s and 80s, people thought, Quite anti, 
Ben gave us very taboo. And I think uh, one thing about Pride Marches has changed public opinion considerably. When I looked at LGBT things, it was like looking at another country. You know, I'd like to go there and have a look, but I just I haven't, got, I haven't got a passport to go, like, you know. <laughs> uh, but also all that changed, January 2002. I get the passport. Everyone who's either LGBT or part or supports the community should march at Gay Pride. What a lot of older gay men went through was quite atrocious. And a lot of very brave people fought to give gay people the rights that they have today. So it is important. We need to be more united and supportive of each other. Be part of your local LGBT community, maybe do some volunteer work with local LGBT organisations. Be more proactive. I think anything that, that steers towards equality for any persons be it gay, black, woman, man, um, it's always a good step. Civil partnerships were good as far as the law was concerned because I think it gave gay people um, or LGBTQ people the same rights as far as sharing um, you know, your life with somebody, which is very important. As much as things are changing a bit, um, you know, the Catholic Church and, and, and the church isn't necessarily the most gay friendly place so to have your relationship validated by a, a body that doesn't really appreciate you I, I can see how it can can be a little bit um, you know a bit of a problem for some people but I think it's a good thing definitely a good thing. I hadn't and probably still didn't really think that the marriage thing uh, was necessary because we had all the uh, legal rights I would be one of those who say that gay people don't necessarily want to ape straight people. I, changed, I modified my opinion slightly because some of the arguments in Parliament and in the church against uh, marriage for gay people brought out some of the worst from the woodwork. It's the ones who are most vocal, most hostile, who get the publicity. And so I thought, well, OK, if marriage um, lays to rest that kind of opinion and comment once for all, then perhaps we do need it. That really, that really rather got me, that the same-sex marriage. If people weren't allowed to, to marry, then they were considered to be an inferior person. And it can happen to religion or anything. You are, you are equal or you're not. It's as simple as that. I might not realise it, but I, I took that as the meaning I took, that they consider people to be inferior. One thing that made me reluctant to sort of come out, because you almost feel that you're surrendering the fact that you're never going to get married, you're never going to have children, you might die alone. Previously, people could have long-term relationships with someone of the same sex, but not be proud and open about that which is a shame and I think it, you know we sh gay people should have exactly the same rights as far as union. When you get married to someone whether they're the same sex or the opposite sex you're making a commitment to love and cherish and protect and nurture that person for the rest of your life. That's why most people go into it. So why not call it the same thing? At the moment with the civil partnership, the main thing which I don't like is the fact that it's not seen the same as a marriage. It's like they're trying to make your relationship not as meaningful because it's not a man and a woman, which is completely wrong. However you choose, I just want it to be the fact that you have the choice, whereas now you don't have the choice to be married, which isn't fair. When the Civil Partnership Act uh, came in, I thought I, I was invited to one. Two of my friends, I think they were one of the first couples to register for a partnership um, in Redbridge, um, down in Barkingside Registry Office. And I went, and it was the most joyful um, experience. 
and uh, then I went to another one at, at Temple in, in London uh, between a Christian and a Sikh, and they both came in in Sikh dress and headgear, um, marched into sort of Sikh drumming, and the parents on both sides gave them their blessing and were very involved. And it was just a beautiful, moving experience. You know, you couldn't have not had a lump in your throat, really. It was lovely to see it. It's, it's through things like this, what we're doing right now, through kind of being able to discuss and stuff, that attitudes change. And I think that I just, for me, I think that's quite refreshing. I think often there's quite a lot of importance given on to laws changing and on to, you know, change the way that, that it's written about and being able to complain. And that is very important, but also just as important is changing people's attitudes through discussion and through yeah. tackling people's ignorance. Because that's what I've never really witnessed.